You are listening to the API The Docs podcast. We are here to talk about API documentation upstream and downstream. There's a term going around, work as imagined, yeah? And so work as imagined lives in our head about what everybody else does. Now, this is very problematic because, first of all, we imagine it from a point of view that we don't have the skill to do that work that other people do. So people talk at each other uh, in a way that I know how you need to change what you're doing in order for the problem to go away. Of course, nothing that I do is wrong. So I, I don't want to blame people for doing this. This is this is what humans do. This is how we intuitively behave. But Adam Kahane, who's a transformation expert, but also so has a background in conflict resolution, he coined this phrase that usually resonated with me, in my experience, um, was validated many, many, many times, is change happens when we no longer think about what other people have to do different in order for the problem to resolve, but start to think what we can do in order to resolve the problem. So the first step is actually that we communicate to other people what we do. That's the nice thing about talking about practices. As I said, practices are shared. So it's not just you, yeah? All developers are doing this because this is the current development practice in our organization, this part of our organization. So it's not about you, it's about how the organization treats this practice and when we want to change it is practice theorists say a practitioner is only a vessel of the practice but the practice itself is part of the context in which we're practicing you take the, the individual as the person that would receive the blame completely out of the conversation that isn't necessary anymore it doesn't happen anymore because you just say how are we practicing this particular thing and how do we need to change practicing this particular thing to eliminate some friction? How do we improve the practice so that the energy flows through the system? Hello and welcome to the API The Docs podcast. Your host today are myself, Annette Pozsár, and my colleague Laura Vas. In our daytime jobs, we research and build developer portals at Pronovix. But the audience is rarely the, uh, the same persona, so it's really hard to to translate and filter the information uh, without this cognitive bias, what we just uh, heard and learned. And I was wondering if, uh, uh, based on practice theory, is it possible to reach a, a neutral point of view or, or a holistic approach to better not be biased with all these context Sometimes it's not even about different roles, but uh, for example, staying with the example of a developer, it's about the seniority. I mean, a, a junior developer, of course, needs more context and additional information than a senior developer does. And and actually, it's hard to draw the line when we are documenting because um, we can found ourselves uh, getting stuck in one of the extremes. I mean, uh, uh, super short and uh, um, just a two-step, a uh, uh, few-step documentation, which is maybe uh, full with um, terms that a junior can't understand, um, or even um, use internal terms instead of exter uh, external terms. And uh, we can also end up with a, a documentation like a thesis when there are many notes and uh, um, other um, additional information which a senior finds um, too much and uh, just won't read it. So it, it's really hard to to draw the line because there is no cookie cutter for that. And maybe what is missing is a bit of a shared vocabulary across, let's say, the globe of marking up which type of information is what? So if we would mark up in API documentation, hey, the next two pages is contextual information, I'm not sure that would go down well. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but it is really missing what you mentioned. But So it might also be an issue of presentation. So I, I haven't been developing for 10 odd years, so I, I might be completely off my rocker in the assumptions I make about how, how you're uh, documentation comes along but i imagine it's still um it, it, it's probably a web version so a hyperlinked version of a book still as in 
Okay, you don't quite have to go and browse through a book linearly, um, but it's mostly textual with some imagery or maybe some schematics for illustrations. Like use cases are still usually living separately, right? Or case studies. And those explain a lot of these tacit assumptions. But my expectation is still you start with some sort of a table of contents and then you just drill down. Yeah, yeah that is true. Yeah. So um, what Chris and I are doing with maturity mapping is, is so this builds on Simon Wardley's work of, of mapping itself more than just the particular strategic version of sporty mapping is that it allows you actually to look at the system uh, in a sense like maps. So if, if you think about a map of a territory, a geographical map, yeah, so you can have a map at different resolutions. Yeah, so you can you can, you can have a, a, a A4 sheet of paper showing you France, yeah? So what you will see is some, some relevant things for this the, the country as its own, but you wouldn't want to go hill walking with that kind of resolution. Yeah, you'd say, okay, I'm going hill walking around certain mountains in the Pyrenees. I want to, I don't know, a one to 20,000 or something resolution. So you can actually see where are crevices and where are, are cliffs and et cetera, that you get around and where might be a, a nice gentle path to, to take it. So going between different resolutions. So if we would <laughs> use a map analogy, yeah, that would allow you to zoom in and out. And then depending on your expertise, yeah, so uh, a senior developer might be able to say, okay, at a one to 100,000 resolution, I know there's a little shading. Yeah, yeah, I know that means cliff. <laughs> yeah, but I'm not going there, so I don't need to read the detail. Uh, where a junior developer said, what is the shading? I have no idea what the shading is. So he wants to go, or she wants to go to a 1 to 20,000 resolution. So she, oh, so that's what cliffs look like. Yeah. Oh, yeah, now I know because I have seen them in real, so I can now make the compact. So uh, if you would use a map, of your, so a visual uh, metaphor rather than just a textual one, that, that might allow you to cater for these differences. Everybody can pick the granularity for the problem they're trying to solve which might not always be a senior junior, might also be a, is this area of the map relevant to me or not problem? Mm -hmm. And we share that uh, this is what I meant by the vocabulary. When we have a map, it's part of our education, uh, intentional or not, that we learn the meaning of resolution. And when you look at a map, you learn that you have to first look at the resolution. And so you understand what resolution means so that you can self-serve and self-choose which map you need. And I think for um, API documentation, this is still very much in the shaping of what would the word resolution in mapping be in API documentation and how do you how do you immediately identify that just to the blink of an eye? Yeah. So this is an experience of again, we had an agile for a while, lean and well. The visualizations are better than textual representations. That mm. um, it's easy for us, especially so understanding complex. Uh, interactions dependencies if if we have a visual representation of course the visual representation has to be meaningful not every visual representation is so equally we experienced lots of things in lean and agile that looked visual but didn't help but if you have visual representations we can take in more context more quickly than we can read mm -hmm. and so having something visual is m might be helpful in this context We've seen some examples for that. In the um, the last season of API to Docs, we had showcases for some very stellar developer portals. And um, some of them were saying, yes, we have realized this, that sometimes a very visual, not as read from top button, top to button uh, kind of uh, example is more helpful um, for, for different types of personas. And they started uh, including uh, even those screenshots and, and, and illustrations are really a pain for technical writers to maintain and scale, um, that they started including that exactly for this reason. Yeah, so As in, given, given that in an API documentation, you are documenting something material, so mm. wordly mapping might be actually a good starting point for what, how could you create these maps and how could they be navigated? Yeah, like in, we're used to seeing uh, logic schemas or architectural schemas in a in a sort of nipping or or, or well not text based form 
and and that this will probably have to come for APIs also, the more complicated they complex they become. Yeah, so one quality that I would say wording mapping in this context would have over classical box wire diagrams is that it allows you to uh, set a hierarchy mm -hmm. in terms of, you know, so how close to the surface of your interaction are things. So at the top of the map, you would have the things that you directly interact with further down, you will have things that you need to understand, but you actually only interact indirectly interact with. So things that are, so I, I have used the, the, the metaphor of membrane. Um, some membranes in, in living beings are, are not just, you know, thin walls. They are like organs themselves in which lots of things happen where some filtering happens, et cetera. So thinking of, of an API as a membrane, as in, so there are things that are really at the surface, but other things in the membrane matter too, in order to actually know what is the right kind of interaction with the API. So then wordly mapping, because it allows you to encode a hierarchy that is consistent across all the maps. So once you understand the hierarchical model, then you understand every, you, you can quickly read every map, um, might be just a little bit easier to uh, navigate than a box wire diagram. Mm -hmm. It might also help, for example, so a wordly map, has a so so the hierarchical thing is there is the y axis the x axis is an evolution axis you could also start um exhibiting a little bit what's the maturity of the components in your api so things that you think yeah they're very good and um very reliable would be on the on the right hand side things that you just started to um, add to the api might be on the left hand side so somebody who's using uh, certain aspects of API might say, okay, if we use these things, that might be more experimental. We need to be more careful and we might not want to expose that to millions of our customers where things on the right, you would say, okay, those are reliable. Um, we use those uh, for, for the vast majority of our customers. <laughs> I'm improvising here. <laughs> <laughs> no, but this approach can be fruitful actually. <laughs> I wanted to go into also a different angle, um, which is hmm. so if I'm a documentarian in a company, which means I'm sort of in a distributed and servicing fashion of production teams uh, and probably even following up in most cases rather than it's 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 a wishful state to be there in the design phase, but not always a possibility. And I see um, inefficiencies, a lot of rework, um, because my job would be to translate inside, outside, uh, between teams, between user personas, verticals, horizontals. And uh, my job would be to make this all scalable and modular. So I would immediately see a lot of inefficiencies. Now, I see the problem. I would now also understand um, how to put on my complexity lens, so to speak, even if it's a very rudimentary one. And I understand that it's not only the artifact, it's not only the people. Now I understand that it's all interdependent and I don't stand a chance in changing things because this system is sustaining itself. Mm. So yeah, my situation is complex and now what? Great that I know this, now I'm even more desperate. Um, when I brought this up to you, Mark, when we were preparing for this, I asked you this understanding, how can I not go towards being even more desperate that I'm entrenched into dealing with an even harder situation now that I know it, but how can I incrementally shift it towards what I think would be good or better? And you brought up um, two, Suggestions. One is to make uh, work visible through value streams. That would be like in lean production. Uh, and the second one was about uh, visualizing these practice networks and making explicit uh, what's going on. Would you like to talk a little bit more about these practice networks? You were hinting at that very much in the, the maturity mapping, but from using the, the words of practice networks as a uh, you know, words are important and it helps to 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 find this information later if you know the words. Mm. So as that as that 
a hypothetical technical writer in a company or documentarian in a company. How can I map this and how can I not go crazy when I get an n-dimensional diagram of what's actually going on? So this is no different to other roles um, or other um, yeah, roles that people fulfill in organizations. So a core thing of making oh, why why does work not always flow smoothly is essentially because we're really bad at understanding what other people in the delivery of value contribute and how they contribute it. So we have always a very good understanding of our own role, and our own context, but what other people do, um, well, we hardly spend any time or half the time to go observe it. So we actually just have an imagination um, of it. Um, there's a term going around, work as imagined, yeah? And so work as imagined lives in our head about what everybody else does. Um, now, this is very problematic because, first of all, we imagine it from a point of view that we don't have the skill to do that work that other people do. So we're not really competent to imagine it. And then also, because we're human beings, we also um, are really biased in how it affects what we do. So the way you experience this is you go in a room uh, with a bunch of people who do different roles uh, to deliver a certain piece of value to solve a problem that has occurred in the delivery of the value. Yeah, And people say, oh, but why don't you do it this way? And so people talk at each other uh, in a way that I know how you need to change what you're doing in order for the problem to go away. Of course, nothing that I do is wrong. Yeah, that. So I, I don't want to blame people for doing this. This is this is what humans do. Yeah, this is how we intuitively behave. Um, but Adam Kahane, who's a, a transformation expert, but also so has a background in conflict resolution, he he coined this phrase that usually resonated with me. In, in my experience. Um, was validated many, many, many times, is change happens when we no longer think about what other people uh, have to do different in order for the problem to resolve, but start to think what we can do uh, in order to resolve the problem. So the first step to do is actually that we communicate to other people what we do. So they can actually point out and say, oh, but when you do this, this doesn't fit the way I work. Yeah, so mm -hmm. the friction in work is literally like, the way I'm doing things doesn't quite fit the way you're doing things. And because it doesn't fit, we have friction. But in order for other people to see how they can change so that friction goes away, we have to explain how we work. So a practice network is literally us visualizing and describing how we do our work. Um, so we talked about social practice theory giving us the three elements, meaning, material, and competence to des describe a practice. So we can start with the meaning, yeah? So we explain, here I'm doing this practice because, yeah? This is the why for my practice, yeah? Why am I doing this? And we can just look at the meanings of all the practices of people interacting in order um, to produce a value and see whether they align. Because if they don't align, that's problem number one where we're friction. Well, if we don't have shared purpose, then we're doing things for, so we're doing things for different purpose, then we are actually not aligned on the value that we're producing. So once we resolve all the meaning conflicts, we can look at the material and say, how. So, what are the material artifacts and tools and infrastructure and all of that that we're using to do the work? And then we say, oh, I'm doing things in SQL, but you're doing things in JSON. Yeah, no wonder we have friction, because every time I throw you some data over in an SQL structure, you have to translate it into a JSON structure. Yeah, so could we maybe use JSON all the way through or something like that? So that removes friction. Um, could we maybe use tools? The way we usually use tools um, is optimized for our purpose, for the individual purpose. So if I'm a dev, I'm looking for the greatest, best dev tools. But once I develop something, then the tester has to use the material that I produce. And then the operators, so people in ops have to use it. Maybe if we would use tools that are good enough for the developer, good enough for the tester and the operator, so we can all use the same tool, we would remove some friction. So that is 
again, looking at the thing, the system as a whole, yeah, not optimizing for me locally, but optimizing for the flow of the material through the system as a whole. And then finally, we can look at competences and say, okay, so I'm doing this work and here I'm applying these, this know-how that is maybe crucial for my role, but I've also know-how about the system in which I work, et cetera. And you don't have any of those competences. You don't have any of this know-how. So if I maybe share some of this know-how so you can apply it in your practices, um, you can figure out ways how to help making the work move more smoothly. So practice theory, or especially um, Elizabeth Shaw's social practice theory, allows us to really drill down on, on a level that it doesn't get to the level that you can just read the description and do the practice, but it enables us to have the crucial conversations that we have to have about our practices, how they fit together, how they're not fit together. Because it's all about, as I said earlier, it's about how you're integrating the practices. It's not just how I integrate developer practices, it's also how we're integrating practice from developer to testers, to documentation, to operator, to consumer of the material that we're producing. So we're making this all explicit so people can actually go in and start seeing how do I fit in here? And can I do something different to fit in better? So we have, in most cases, come to not pointing fingers at the other person as in this is personal, but oh, it's just your behavior. It's not you, it's just your behavior. And then we would be taking this one step further as in, it's not even your behavior because that doesn't really make sense. You're an intelligent person and you're doing what fits the context, but you're carrying out a practice within this scope. And that can be changed once you know what you're doing. That's the nice thing about talking about practices. practices. So as I said, practices are shared. So it's not just you, yeah? All developers mm -hmm. are doing this because this is the current development practice in our organization, this part of our organization. So it's not about you, it's about how the organization treats this practice and when we want to change it is, so practice theorists say a, a, a practitioner is only a vessel of the practice, but the practice itself is part of the context in which we're practicing. Yeah, so it's not, you take the, the individual as, the person that would receive the blame completely out of the conversation that isn't necessary anymore. It doesn't happen anymore because you just say, how are we practicing this mm -hmm. particular thing? And how do we need to change practicing this particular thing to eliminate some friction? How, how do we uh, improve the practice so that the energy flows through the system? Or do you think that the there's particular words that need to be across all these players uh, have a, a same definition to be able to talk on this level? So for example, the word practice, no. like do we do we need to bring in new words into our shared vocabulary to be able to go forward? So in our work, we actually quite often do not talk about practices. No. So we're not using the term. So we're trying, I, I can't say for certain yet, so because also admittedly we're only doing this for we started this journey about three years ago. So this we, we call maturity mapping still an emergent practice in the worldly sense, which means this is new. Yeah. Mm -hmm. This is not yet stabilized. This is not we don't we have some confirmation of some things, but a, a lot of the stuff still changes every time we do it. We learn new things and it changes uh, through the experience. Um, but in general, we're trying to not be very explicit about Here's the theory they're all applying, and you need to learn practice theory, etc. But it guides our thinking. But so we, for example, in practice theory, the there is a word, yeah, how how they call something when you integrate a bunch of practices. So when I said driving, it says like you're steering, you're braking, you're changing gears, you're checking the mirror, you're applying traffic rules. These are all practices in themselves. So you need to integrate them in your context. They call this a complex. And initially we talked about practice complexes and people just looked at it, googly eyes and, what, what are you talking about? So then we just started to realize that the word that we use in organizations for this is capability. And we just started to talk about organizational capabilities. 
So as a development team, what capabilities do we have? Oh yeah, so we can do trunk-based development. We don't need to talk about this is a complex of practices, yeah? We just talk about the capability that they have. Equally, we, we, we when we ask people to describe practices, we talk about activities. So what are you doing here? How do you, how do you call this? What's this activity? We try to use normal words because while the theory is guiding our thinking and our approach, there's no need for people who we work with um, to know all this theory. So if you are somebody who's applying maturity mapping, if we teach you how to do it, yes, you will have to learn. We, we teach you practice theory and complexity and a bunch of other things because, first of all, we want you to understand where our thinking comes from so that you also can help us improve the whole thing. So maybe point down at one point, you're wrong over there. Yeah, that thing that you're trying to doesn't work that way. Um, but the people we do this with, we we use their vocabulary. But what applying this has, has shown us is that there needs to be more shared vocabulary between them about how they call these things, yeah, that they're using tools, materials, um, flows, etc. Um, and that that there is in general, a lack of shared vocabulary in the first place. And doing this kind of analysis brings this vocabulary to the fore, as in suddenly, oh, now we're suddenly talking all about, we're calling this thing a spade a spade, yeah? Mm -hmm. And this goes, for example, hand in hand with what people experience in the domain-driven development uh, field of knowledge, where they say, Oh, because we're starting thinking about these things, we start to create a shared language. So in the same sense, I would say practice theories promotes this kind of shared language. It's a different angle. It's a different approach to arrive at the same outcome. And it's a, it's it's just an alternative solution for the same phenomenon. And then we're back to the domain of technical writers again and in product development where... You, you find those words and you pin them down so that people use them the same way again. Thank you very much, Mark. Um, if somebody wants to dig a bit deeper, so you mentioned some literature. Uh, one of them was uh, Elizabeth. Um, Elizabeth Shove. Elizabeth Shove. Um, is there other, um, well, let's say consumable um, entry points uh, to to adopting uh, this perspective too, be that, that uh, complexity theory or uh, social. Yeah, it depends how deep you want to go. So, if you want to understand the origins of practice theory, I would recommend uh, there's a book from Pierre Bourdieu where this more or less starts the thinking. So he talks about habitus, about the field of habits at that point as a way of explaining culture. So when we say culture eats strategy for breakfast, one of the issues there is is, what is that we actually don't have vocabulary to talk about culture. So it 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 sort of comes and sneaks up from the back and hijacks the situation. But that's that's more because we're actually not usually not capable to talk about culture. Yeah. So Bourdieu was the first one who gave us maybe a a socially applicable. Uh, way of talking about culture. And so uh, habitus is, is one of the terms. There's some other terms that he came up with that are very useful. Um, if you want to understand complexity theory, it's Listen not to the, the complexity easiest... podcast. <laughs> well, yes, maybe start there, but um, maybe listen to the interview we've done with Alicia Correiro, which I think will be published soon, um, or maybe has, will have been weeks. published by the in time you publish weeks, this one. Mm -hmm. Um, and then she wrote a book, uh, Dynamics in Action, and there will be another book coming out in the fall. Um, they might be a bit tough to start. So my starting point for complexity theory was a book called uh, The Creative, no, The Self-Organizing Universe. Sorry, this is a difference in German and English. Uh, I read it initially in German, but in English it's called The Self-Organizing Universe by Erich Jansch who uh, was one of the first philosophers involved in this kind of uh, theory thinking. Um, the first part of the book really explains complexity theory or the thinking behind complexity theory in a very nice and uh, accessible way. It is written 
uh, was meant for the public, uh, for general public, for lay people, so it makes it very accessible. The second part is very speculative, so I think you could skip that. Um, in order to also maybe understand why context becomes more and more important, even on a on a political and 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 societal level, I can recommend Bruno Latour, um, who also um, introduced us to this term of social construct. Uh, and basically, show even scientists when they create facts how they are socially constructed and how they are contextual, and maybe just to give you an alternative to Elizabeth Shove or a further source that I find very useful for practice theory, Sylvia Gerardi, that's G-H-E-R-A-R-D-I. Um, she wrote several um, books and, and articles about how you apply actually practice theory in, in observational studies. Uh, so that was very helpful for us also to start to understand how, how do we interact with people so we can start visualizing these things and make them tangible. Thank you. And as a bit of a closure, so why, why is this important? Because we can't hide from this anymore, especially documentarians. Since they have to document systems, they have to understand that this is becoming undeniably complex. And until you understand that, you cannot possibly document it properly. If you say so. <laughs> I yeah. don't fully agree with that. And here I was trying to say something that would fit on a book cover. No, no. I, so I, I buy that, but just because I have the same experience with other roles. So... Mm -hmm. um, this might be also just one more thing to jot in. So if you look at it through the practice lens, role is not something you are, yeah? It's not like you are a developer or you are a tester. So role is a persona that you are performing in a specific context to achieve a specific outcome. So as I said, practices are something where you reproduce an outcome reliably. So the role is just a persona you perform. Um, but in order to actually improve how we work, so we all don't want to be stuck in a role identity. We want to be able to perform whatever is necessary to produce outcomes. So if we start looking at work through the lens of you are producing, you are just reproducing practices in a context um, to, to produce an outcome, we also can allow people to step outside of traditional role boundaries. And that will be necessary um, to improve work. Thank you, Mark, and thank you for being here. It was thank my pleasure. Mark. Thank you, Anna. Thank you, Mark. And until next time, bye bye. Thank you for listening to the API The Docs podcast. Thanks again to our guest, to Pronovix, for letting us work on this, and the entire API The Docs community for all of the mutual support and sharing of experiences that you give each other. Do you have a topic or guest you would like us to spotlight? Drop a note at podcast at pronovix.com. If you go to the website apidocs.org, you can find the recaps and recordings of past API The Docs conferences, as well as the upcoming program. Until next time, be well.